Um, we're going to go straight into a Q&A. Um, so Richard's going to come up. Uh, we'll take questions on uh, any, uh, either, either topics or any topics involving 9-11. Um, we're going to start by taking a few questions off cards. Uh, and then um, we're going to open up a mic over here for people to come up and ask questions. Uh, and then, uh, we're, then we're going to open it up even more with passing a mic around and try to get more of a discussion going on uh, that you, of issues that you might want to talk about. So, thank you very much. Okay. I'm just going to start reading them from the top here. And either one of you, feel free. And lights on the stage, please. And microphone. Lights on the stage. The firefighters and other witnesses of the explosions, where are they now? Are they willing to come forward <clears throat> and, and uh, again and testify to the American public? There are hundreds of uh, witnesses of fires and explosions and uh, very, well, none of them have been included in the official reports, as we mentioned. Um, many of them have come forward, and uh, of course, and are quite willing to come forward again. But there's no venue for them, official venue, to come forward in. So this is one of the reasons we need a, a real investigation that offers immunity for those who may need it, uh, offers um, uh, other incentives for people to come forward uh, and takes that testimony under oath and, and looks at all of the evidence, of course, not just that which is, ends up in, in the official reports, but evidence of explosions, incendiaries, molten metal, the behavior of the buildings. So all of this is extremely important and that's the kind of of investigation that the 2,000 architects and engineers that I represent are looking for, uh, a one that is real, that has teeth, um, and uh, that's one that we'll accept. So I, I guess that this is in response to what we've seen today. So what? What can change? How? Tough one. Everything. <laughs> um, we, we live in a post 9-11 world. We, that's been said many times. It's obviously clear. We have this endless war on terror, uh, so to speak, or so, so named, uh, that uh, we were promised by Dick Cheney would last our lifetime and so far, so, so bad. <laughs> Um, this is the world we live in now, ever-increasing police state. That's what can change. And 9-11 Truth has the power to change people's minds so that they will not support these wars and will not support this police state and this ever-increasing uh, surveillance state that's been revealed more recently. Um, much more could be said, I'm sure. If it was not a demo, if it was, if it had not been a demolition, and just the planes, what would be the outcome of the damage to the buildings, possibly, or what what could have happened if it was just airplanes? Well, what happened is the airplanes hit the buildings, and we have an explosion and jet fuel fires that died down almost completely in the case of the South Tower, and they would have burned themselves out like they do in high-rise fires. And nothing would have happened. Uh, pe people, some people obviously would have died. The rest would have evacuated the buildings. The buildings would still be there. In fact, that's a direct quote from John Skilling, the structural engineer of these buildings, under whom Leslie Robertson uh, worked, whom you worked for, whom you saw in our DVD as one of the witnesses of molten metal. So um, nothing, nothing would have happened uh, to these towers. Now, if they, if, and, and if something were to happen to these towers, uh, we wouldn't have expected the, the top-down, near-free-fall uh, destruction and the total shattering of these structures with laterally ejected elements and so forth. 
we might have seen a large gradual groaning uh, uh, mass of structure starting to, to uh, look as if it was going to fail and eventually fall off the side of the, uh, of, of the towers. Uh, that's, that's a more plausible example of a catastrophic failure that could have happened with asymmetric damage such as we had from the airplanes and the jet fuel fires, jet fuel started fires. I want to add a comment about this topic related to, again, psychology and the fact that 9-11 was a carefully designed psychological operation. If the towers, our minds work in terms of symbols and mythologies and archetypes, and the symbol of if those towers had been hit by planes and stood up, the subconscious message would be given is, we, are, we still stand strong. In other words, the buildings kind of symbolize the country in a certain sense, and if they'd been hit and stood, the message would be, we're, we're still not that vulnerable because they can even run planes into buildings and we just stand up and stand strong. Instead, we got the opposite message if, that we're vulnerable that just a couple of people with box cutters can, can do incredible damage here. So we got to be scared and hypervigilant and go to war and do all these things. And the reason that worked is that buildings falling down are actually an archetypal imagery. There is an archetype called the tower knocked down. And it's an archetype that's in our subconscious, unconscious mind. And so what we saw on TV that day was literally an archetype, and archetypes are the substructure out of which our reality is created. And so we saw an actual archetype happening on TV, and, and, and the message of that archetype is, in, in this case, to make us feel weak and vulnerable and wanting daddy, i.e. the government, to come and rescue us, us poor little children who are defenseless in the, from, from uh, terrorists. Uh, so the buildings, in a sense, had to come down in order to make 9-11 the effective psychological operation that it was. How long would it take to plant all the explosives in the three buildings? And how could the hundreds of maintenance people not see them? It would take dozens of operatives months to plant uh, these explosives in the buildings and uh, as a matter of fact uh, if they had access to the elevator shafts in the Twin Towers they would have access to the core columns and beams uh, immediately adjacent to those shafts and so uh, we'd be looking for such access that is what happened actually Ace Elevator had the contract to replace the elevator systems in these buildings the nine months prior to 9-11. And so there were dozens and dozens of, of, of mechanics or operatives working in those shafts uh, during that time. In fact, it was quite a scandal because they fled on 9-11 when the first plane hit the first building. This was documented in USA Today. So. Uh, it, it really needs to be reviewed. Somebody needs to look at Ace Elevator, who went out of business right after 9-11, interestingly enough. Uh, so uh, ch check it out. March 2001, Elevator World, the largest modernization in, in, in history. No one would have seen, of course, uh, the, the, operative, the, the people, the mechanics, whatever, contractors in the, in the, in the uh, shafts uh, because the, uh, they're hidden and they're doing work, which was um, condoned, theoretically. The one thing I want to add uh, is the t about the timing. Uh, I sat next to a woman on a plane who uh, was interested in my t-shirt or whatever, <laughs> got to talking about 9-11. She told me about military-style demolitions that, for a smaller building, not the size of the Twin Towers, that a military operation can go into a building, plant explosives in it, and bring it down in hours. 
the standard routine military type of thing. Now what we have here isn't exactly that. Number one, we're talking about very big buildings. And number two is they had time. This was not just strictly a military operation. Uh, they, had, they had the weeks that it would take um, to do a, 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 to plant the sheer volume of uh, nanothermite and other explosives that were used. But the point is these things can be done very quickly by military style teams, which is almost certainly who did it. Uh, please explain thermite uh, use in electrical construction practices. Um, your view of the traces that were found. Uh, I, I don't know about electrical contracting or engineering. It's not thermite is an incendiary used by the military to cut through steel like a hot knife through butter. It's 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 made by putting aluminum and iron oxide, which is rust powders together and igniting it at a very high temperature and then it produces these 4500 degree molten issuance of molten iron so it's not used um, uh, well it's it's early use began but when they welded railroad ties together in the railroad industry it's used today by the military they have thermite grenades that are used to to disable tanks and, and other uh, heavy steel objects that they don't want to fall into enemy hands. Uh, I hope I answered the question. After this session, we can have a, a series of follow-up questions where you, you can, uh, you, we can probe deeper in, into these issues. Uh, we have a two-parter here. Um, why haven't the families of 9-11 victims um, united and spoke out more and is it true outspoken witnesses have died or become missing? Uh, in, in terms of the family, uh, the families, they have made extraordinary efforts. Uh, it, it was a result of the Jersey Girls, as they called themselves, that there was even a 9-11 commission report, uh, even though it ended up being a cover-up, that even that investigation wouldn't have had happened without their tireless efforts. And there were more than just the four Jersey girls we know about. There were other family members that supported them. Uh, so um, I don't think they're falling down on the job at, at, at all. And there's many uh, that are ongoing supportive of, 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 of a new investigation and they've even in the 9-11 the Truth Movement. In fact, um, there's dozens of family members on our petition uh, because there's not only 1,900 plus others, but there's over 17,000 excuse me, 1,900 plus architects and engineers, but 17,000 others on our petition. There's letters on our website from many of them. Any comment on the uh, part? Uh, is it true outspoken witnesses have died or become, become missing? I like that. Well, the one case we kind of suspect is Jer Barry Jennings, um, the, the man that was inside World Trade Center 7 and reported explosions going off in the morning before either tower dropped. Uh, there's probably uh, uh, more, but uh, and he may have died of natural causes. We don't know. Uh, it's actually surprising how few seem to have died, but Richard, do you want to add to that? No. <laughs> Some people ask me, have you ever been intimidated, um, or threatened, or, or assassinated? I, 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 no, I haven't been assassinated. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly haven't. I also haven't been uh, threatened or intimidated. Uh, there are plenty of people who have had their, their jobs um, uh, threatened, and uh, uh, Stephen Jones, for instance, the finder of the key finder of the thermite um, evidence in the World Trade Center dust was fired. Well, he was early terminated from his job as a BYU professor. There are several stories like that. Kevin Barrett is another example. Um, uh, as far as Kevin Ryan as well, who worked at Underwriter Labs, uh, who exposed the relationship uh, well between NIST and Underwriter Labs, as well as saying, uh, finding uh, that uh, in Underwriter Labs, his employer was the one who actually uh, did the testing of the steel assemblies uh, showing that they met their required fireproofing 
uh, objectives uh, early on in the construction uh, and engineering of the World Trade Center towers. Um, they also, Underwriter Labs was hired by NIST during the investigation, if you can call it that, really the series of building reports, where they actually uh, put 2,000 degree fires underneath mocked up uh, constructed samples of the floor systems that were used in the World Trade Center and they sagged and they did not fail. Uh, so it was a very successful test which he tried to publicize. Uh, he was uh, terminated uh, due to um, uh, poor judgment uh, was the official cause. Um, this is addressed to Richard. Richard, how did you rise above, above uh, the fear that you would be targeted by someone uh, to shut you up? Or did you have any fear of that? At, um, and, and maybe just the fear of voicing the issue in general from having not known about it to knowing about it. Yeah, early on I did start to uh, look over my shoulder a little bit because this is a big deal, right? I mean, uh, if these people can pull that off, then they don't want us up here on this stage. But uh, we have not had that many uh, issues. Uh, I haven't had any issues. Um, so. I've, I've learned to, um, A, uh, not worry about it anymore, uh, but B, continue to do what I'm doing no matter what happens, because uh, I would rather uh, die speaking the truth than live in a police state. And that's where we're heading. Well, I wasn't asked, but I'm going to speak anyway. Um, I, as as I think was mentioned, I started doing this uh, research just days after the event and started becoming more visible in public uh, in early 2002 when there, the mo truth movement scarcely existed and there were very few people talking about this. And uh, of course there was some fear and trepidation about, you know, when, when's the FBI going to be coming up and questioning me or whatever. Um, so I, uh, that fear persisted for a while and then the movement grew and grew and grew and there's so many millions of us now that you know it's kind of almost silly to be afraid when there's so many millions of us. But in any event, uh, the way I handled that fear was to go to the philosophy that I have been studying and working with uh, for many decades, which is I believe we create our own reality, that, that we are uh, empowered uh, people and that um, we're not ultimately victims of anything and therefore if I were if I truly believed that which was obviously challenged by getting involved with this work then um, then I if I if something bad would happen to me it's because I would create that and why would I create that which is the question that you have to ask if you're going to work with that kind of philosophy and so I had to do some real inner work in terms of looking at okay you know how much do I really believe this because here I am taking on a job role, which was, and this of course, during the early days of the Bush administration, it was right after the Patriot Act had been passed. We didn't know what that meant or what the implications of it was. And um, so uh, I kind of, you know, it was a real test of, of my own uh, d belief in, in that I create my own reality and that um, if, if anything bad were to happen, that would be my responsibility and, and part of the philosophy is understanding how that works. Well, that's another whole big subject, but uh, bottom line is uh, nothing's happened of any adverse nature whatsoever. How much uh, collaboration do you two do with firefighters for 9-11 Truth and airline pilots for 9-11 Truth? And I just want to comment, if you ever Google for 9-11 Truth, you will find a, a lot of professional organizations that are very serious about this. So how much collaboration? Yeah, there are dozens. In fact, um, Eric Lawyer, the founder of Firefighters for 9-11 Truth, and myself on behalf of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, had a dual presentation where he covered the massive amount of uh, evidence that firefighters would be particularly interested in and were in, involved in. And uh, myself from the uh, pr building professional side, 
Uh, this uh, is a DVD we're still working on uh, that is expected to be out uh, hopefully, hopefully next year. It's gotten quite a delay. But um, it's, a, it's a great presentation, uh, at, and, and it's just too bad that we can't bring Eric Lawyer uh, all over the country because his presentation style, which by the way, you can get uh, about 10 minutes of in the DVD called the San Francisco Press Conference, which is on our table outside. Eric Lawyer, David Ray Griffin, Stephen Jones, and myself, when we reached 1,000 architects and engineers, gave a, a really a startling, powerful press conference. Uh, which summarizes this evidence uh, from all of those parties uh, very, very well. But we do collaborate uh, uh, quite often with firefighters. Pilots, not so much because I'm a building professional and, and the planes um, are, are uh, a, a, a quote, irrelevant part of our work because we want to show how the buildings came down. Um, and there are, is so much controversy around whether planes hit the buildings, uh, what kind of planes hit the buildings, what, the, uh, what their effect was. Uh, it's just a distraction from the controlled demolition, the explosions in the buildings. So we, we stay focused on that. Uh, the pilots for 9-11 Truth uh, have looked at uh, the, all four planes also, two of which had nothing to do uh, with the Twin Towers where we're focused. Uh, we do shy away from the Pentagon at Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth even though it is a building uh, because there's so much controversy again about whether a plane did or didn't hit it and, and actually a lot of argument uh, about the evidence there. What we all agree on uh, relative to the Pentagon is that nothing should have hit that building, um, uh, most highly defended building in the world and that uh, there's plenty, dozens and dozens of very high-res photos that the Pentagon has that would show exactly what did or didn't hit it. I'm going to just uh, read one more off the card, and then anyone who would like to um, come up and approach the microphone over here, you feel free to come up and ask a question. Um, the uh, other question off the card is, um, where, what is a good source of information for the ties between CIA and corporate media? Operation Mockingbird. Ah, short answer. Yeah, please come up now. Start lighting up at the mic. Um, yeah, Google Operation Mockingbird. Uh, I gave just the briefest description of that uh, in my presentation. There's, there's lots more uh, showing conclusively that uh, operation Mockingbird was a CIA operation and its purpose was to gain more control of the media. They already had quite a bit before that, but they, they ramped that up big time. Now, Marcella has a, a microphone as well. Do, how do we want to We're gonna start with this one. just hold off for yeah. a while? Okay, so stand, stand by, Marcella. Hi. Will this, uh, this one? No. <laughs> Hi. I'll, I'll trade you. Well, how about this one? Yeah. Is this, yeah, okay. This would suggest to me that, uh, thank you guys for coming this afternoon. It's been really, really good. Thank you very much. Uh, this, the downing of the building suggests there was some coordination between those behind in the cockpit and those on the ground. You haven't spoken to that at all. Uh, and the other thing is, has no one been interviewed that actually set those charges? I mean, we, th there ought to be dozens, if not hundreds, of people involved with that. So you're talking about the people in the cockpits of the four planes? Yes. The I mean, if, if, if or, or would those buildings have come down in spite of the airplanes? Well, sure, they were loaded with controlled demolition, but... Um, so so, so you're, you're saying that the, the planes hitting it had nothing to do with the controlled demolition? Effectively not, especially Building 7, right? Um, it is no a strong, plane at Building 7. It's a strongly held opinion of a very high percentage of the 9-11 Truth Movement that all four planes were operated by remote control. That there were no pilots piloting those planes. They were effectively guided missiles. Um, this has been substantiated in any number of ways, um, including um, 
that the two models of planes that were used on 9-11, 767s, 757s, come from factory stock with a, uh, ironically, uh, hijacking, averting technology so that the planes can be remotely controlled. So this is already built into the plane, so it's incredibly easy to implement. And um, in fact, one of the reasons we know that uh, is that uh, Andreas von Bülow from Germany described to us how when Lufthansa took um, delivery of these planes years ago, and the pilots found out that they were, they did have this feature allowing that the pilots uh, to lose control of their planes and uh, it to be remote guided, um, they didn't like that, and they refused to allow that uh, feature in those planes, and they were removed from German Lufthansa planes. When was this, Ken? Uh, this was, I think, in the 90s, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, in any event, um, the planes were almost certainly remote controlled. A, it's easy to do. B, it assures that the operation is going to be pulled off. Uh, one of the approaches I've taken, uh, take a little side trip here, uh, to answering questions like this is as a systems engineer, I look at the 9-11 operation as if it was handed to me as a project. Okay, we, we want to do this thing. We want to terrorize the American people. We're going to bring these buildings down. We're going to use planes as the excuse. Um, we're going to have these patsies set up as the alleged hijackers. Um, go, go engineer this. And as an engineer, you want to make sure, especially in something like this where it's a one-shot deal and it has to work first, perfectly the first and only time, that it is as reliable as it possibly can be. So you simplify it, you do it in the easiest, uh, most elegant manner possible, and you make sure that every aspect of it is going to work. And uh, the idea of any humans flying those planes when they're on a suicide mission, that's a wild card. It would never be considered in an operation like this. Instead, you do something you know can work and can even be done without uh, a human hand on it, which is you remote guide them using any combination of technologies, including GPS, including, which is, again, uh, I've, I've talked to a pilot who said, yeah, you can just plug in the coordinates of where you want the plane to go. He flew 757s, by the way. Put, put in the, the uh, exact coordinates where you want that plane to go. The plane will fly itself using GPS as guidance to anywhere on the planet within a few feet. Now, that's reliable, and that's what was used. I, I have zero doubt of it because uh, you wouldn't possibly leave it up to human error. So the pilots were irrelevant. Uh, we don't know exactly what happened. They may, everyone on the plane, they could have just depressurized the plane and everybody would have died and then there would have been no objections. But uh, the planes were remote control. Especially <clears throat> pilots like Hani Hanjur, who failed Cessna flying school, who was, as we're told, the, the pilot who uh, flew the, the airplane that was allegedly uh, hitting the Pentagon uh, around the Pentagon, diving uh, 6,000 feet in, in three minutes in a, in a 270 degree corkscrew, which most pilots say they couldn't even manage in, a, in an airliner like that. Uh, can you step up to the microphone, please? Come on. You can follow up. Yeah. Well, okay. I was just going to add my second. My, my second question was oh, yeah. Has there been no one that's been interviewed that had a hand in setting those charges? No. And they wouldn't. I mean, well, yeah, basically so, what you're talking about is a secret team, as Fletcher Prouty identified these kinds of operations. Fletcher Prouty is one of the uh, ex-CIA uh, officials that helped us unravel the Kennedy assassination. And he wrote uh, extensively on this idea of secret teams, which he used to run. Um, and that these teams are assembled, they're, they're given a job to do, they do the job, they're disassembled, they disappear. But more importantly is who are these people that would do something like this? Uh, I already discussed this idea of psychopaths. People that are so ruthless and so lacking in remorse, they're willing to knowingly participate in mass murder. So that's part of the answer to the question. Another part of the answer is um, in the hierarchies of the military and of the Secret Service, and I'm not talking about just this country, I'm talking about other countries as well. In order to advance past certain levels, you have to pass certain sort of tests that show what kind of person you are. And the only people that attract, that get to the highest levels and are used in teams uh, doing something as ruthless as 9-11 are the psychopaths, the willings that are willing to do anything 
because they lack remorse. And um, those are the people, and they're not going to come forth because of who they are. They, they're perfectly content with what happened. They probably got paid either extraordinary amounts of money and or they were murdered thereafter. They're not going to come forth. Uh, thank you. I'm actually setting my alarm because I have to leave, and I'm sorry I can't stay here. But I would like to thank both of you and all the other people that made this event possible. And I thought before I go, I could offer a couple resources that have been useful to me <laughs> from up north in Seattle, where I come from. Please, introduce yourself too, please. Oh, uh, okay. My name is Bert Sachs. I'm no relation to Goldman Sachs. Let's establish that right away. And, um, well, I, up there I have a certain notoriety for having gone to Iraq nine times during the sanctions period. And so I was involved in a difficult issue and um, what Ken said earlier about deciding what kind of, what you both said, what kind of world you want to live in and acting accordingly is what I discovered when I decided I should try and get myself prosecuted by the federal government for going to Iraq to bring medicines there. Because I thought, can this be legal? Can we be killing hundreds of thousands of children there? Sorry, my alarm's gone off. Well, <laughs> this, this will keep things quick. <laughs> um, and it really was very good, the outcome of that, even though I remember lying in bed thinking, do I know what I'm doing? Of course, this is off topic, but it's kind of interesting because after um, I got fined $10,000 for going to Iraq and went to D.C. to announce why I wouldn't pay the fine, the Seattle Hearst paper, the PI, did a great front page story. Lawyers came to me and said, would I like pro bono advice? We sued the federal government. It got on Amy Goodman's Democracy Now! and uh, some other local, the Seattle Times, the more conservative paper, the editorial writer did a very good repeated story about it. So I would second the principle that decide what kind of world you want and then act accordingly and act with as much conscience. And besides that, it changes you inside and you become less fearful and you become more, you have more integrity. So, uh, okay, now a couple of resources I can, can offer people. Can I make just one comment uh, supporting what you're saying? Uh, this idea that you feel better inside is proven uh, through studies that people that take action um, are happier, more content, more, they're just, they're just happier people than people that know about things that aren't good and take no action. It's, it's a proven fact. Yeah. Well, all of that was a, d a digression to what I wanted to say, which is um, just in the very first book that you put up, Ken, which was Jim Douglas's book, JFK and the Unspeakable. It's a wonderful book. I came down with it because I think there are direct connections, dots to be made, connected between the assassination of an American president, where 75% of Americans don't believe the government story, and now 9-11. And Jim provides for me a model of somebody approaching such a difficult subject after 50 years coming up in November of this year with such integrity and such deep spiritual self-confidence that it's a great book, I recommend it. Now, um, the other thing that I've just discovered is a poem by Alice Walker the author of The Color Purple, because people know Alice Walker, at least when I say The Color Purple, they do. And she wrote a poem called 9-11, An Irrelevant Truth. And it's a great poem, and she calls it a humongous lie. And she shows some empathy and understanding of the people that can't go there at the end of the poem. It's only, well, a page and a half, really. Um, but then she says, if people won't go there, what that means is the truth is irrelevant. And that's the name of her poem. And so I'll put a couple copies out on the table, I'm sorry. The other the last thing is I made a hundred copies of these, and it's partly a question that is implicit in what I want to say. I went to the Fellowship of Reconciliation annual conference for Oregon and Washington. It's held out at a place called Seebeck. 
and I'd gone there a few years. It's, it's the oldest peace and justice group in the world, I believe, international, 44 countries. And I also work with American Friends Service Committee and the Quakers, and these people don't know about 9-11, many of them. And I thought, okay, this time I'm going, I'm going to do something about 9-11. And I had a couple mini workshops, I showed the videos, and I thought, you know, some people came out, but not very many, 15 out of about 200. So then the last thing I want to suggest and leave you with is <clears throat> there's a talent show that they do. It's four days, it's fun, there's music, there's all kind of stuff. It's not all talk and serious. And you don't have to have no talent whatsoever to be in the talent show. So I said, I qualify for that. And I said, what will I do? I said, okay, these people need to know about 9-11. I decided I'm going to be World Trade Center 7. I'm going to stand there. I have this long <laughs> night shirt and a funny hat and all the stuff and uh, tell people I'm not just an ordinary building. The CIA and FBI, are, I house them. But I'm really angry at the government because they've made character defamation of me. They say, I'm a weakling. I couldn't stand up with fire and all the other steel frame buildings do stand up. And I had a friend run around me with, with streamers to make like fire. Oh, and then she put this thing down in front of me, which was with my black briefcase. And she had a dozen people in the audience go boom, boom. And I collapsed right in my footprint. Well, the point of it is, it's fun to do things like guerrilla theater, street theater, or maybe somebody could make a cartoon of that, to come to other ways besides presenting all the factual evidence. Uh, that's, uh, maybe that's the exotic category that Ken talked about. So those are things I want to offer people, and sorry if I've gone on a bit long. Thanks. Oh, and let me... Let Thank me. you. Movement uh, and drift in, uh, say, a seismic event. I don't know that that's true. Uh, it may be, but uh, well, it was I part thought I would, I would, I think I would have heard about it. But is anybody else aware of seismic equipment to monitor drift in buildings? Maybe part of the California uh, testing phases. Right. The um, uh, under the California um, um, monitoring um, earthquake monitoring um, program, part some of the buildings, and they they try and. Uh, um, uh, use this information to analyze the uh, structural interaction and um, I know that um, part of this I've, I've seen from the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute um, and, and um, I just oftentimes wonder uh, the um, motion data is oftentimes uh, remotely received, so I just wondered if Well, there are certainly seismic stations that picked up seismic activity, mm -hmm. which is very controversial, but one of the things that is corroborated, if you go to journalof911studies.com, in the last year there's been a study which is fascinating because it supports the uh, uh, eyewitness testimony of many where there were explosions mm -hmm. in the basements of the towers. Actually, in some cases, prior to, in one case, prior to the uh, airplane hitting the towers, which is, which is really fascinating. But it, explodes, it, it, it supports the explosive demolition theory. Right. Did I answer the question? Yeah, that, that is what, I'm after, what I'm after in terms of the intent of analyzing the um, motions, it would seem like some of that would be released prior to even the, um, you know, uh, when the planes are hitting, it could even uh, be shown that there were explosions possibly before that. Yeah, and, and they did, according to this one study uh, by this French seismologist. There's other studies that seem to be used to support other theories. Mm -hmm. um, such as th that, that it wasn't controlled demolitions. There's a lot of controversy, which is one of the reasons I don't even talk about it, because mm -hmm. I, it's, it, we don't, you almost need to be a seismologist to have anything intelligent to say about it or to understand it. Mm -hmm. I'm not a seismologist, 
And, and actually, you don't even need to be an architect or engineer to see that these buildings are being blown up. So we use common sense. Thank you. Thanks. Mr. Gage, Mr. Jenkins, thanks for uh, doing this. I think it's actually kind of heroic, actually, not to be cheesy, but it is because you set yourself up for a disaster by getting the truth out. I know I've lost friends and relatives uh, as a result of waking up. Here's my thing. Uh, you push uh, Noam Chomsky's uh, material. I was forced to read it in Chico State, journalism school. Noam Chomsky, not 911 truth kind of wrecks my whole paradigm of Mr. Smart Guy Noam Chomsky that I was forced to have to do papers on. Whistleblowers like uh, Julian Assange, who I think is a limited operation CIA NSA shill along with Snowden. Uh, not, Assange is also not into 911 truth. Of course, he says that he, well, we already give out so much information, and we're already giving you the world on a platter here. We're giving you all this information. Don't worry about this crazy 911 stuff, like Assange said. So Assange and, uh, you know, Noam Chomsky, not down with 911 truth. How do you deal with their cognitive dissonance, or is it, are they just shills? What do you say? Uh, in terms of Noam Chomsky, of course you're correct. He does. He doesn't endorse. He does. Uh, he has said publicly that we need new investigation into 9/11. So that's a step. Um, he's one of many um, that are sometimes labeled left gatekeepers, various terms, um, who do not support the 9/11 Truth Movement, other than uh, the limited thing of saying yes, we need a new investigation. Well, that is our ultimate request. So. Um, that's a good step. But nonetheless, uh, Noam Chomsky also believes that um, the Kennedy assassination is the official story. So what's with that? You know, I mean, the point is he has a worldview, comes, that's what it ultimately comes down to, that's really my answer. He has a worldview that these kinds of conspiracies simply don't happen. Um, it, it does seem odd it seems strange uh, to, to those of us that, you know, are looking at it differently. But the point is there's, there's more than a few people like him. And I don't, just the fact that he's public and he's been so outspoken about so many things does not in any way insulate him from being, having that same world view that takes you part way down the rabbit hole but not all the way down. Um, there's something increasingly disturbing the further you go down the rabbit hole. And not everybody has the courage or whatever it takes to go there. And um, it's regrettable. It's uh, definitely uh, not in our favor, but it's part of the world. And, and as long as they at least say, yes, we need a new investigation, I'm willing to give them a pass because, look, there's a lot of people like him. Um, and then um, the other person you mentioned, Assange, Assange uh, I don't actually agree with you that he's some kind of an operative. Um, why he doesn't do 9-11 Truth, I do not know. It, it is another, another mystery. Um, it, it could possibly be something related to worldview, or it could be that he does know and he's choosing for some strategic reasons to say otherwise. I don't know, and none of us know. Uh, but I personally don't think anybody that puts their ass so far on the line as Snowden and Assange do our operatives because their lives are profoundly impacted in a very negative way. And uh, I'm sorry, if you're an operative, you don't sign on to something saying, hey, I'm gonna ruin my life and become you know, this controversial figure. I, I don't think it works that way. I think they're a little more clever than that. And I think Snowden in particular um, is pretty much just what you see is really what he is. My opinion, you asked. Next question. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, an excellent pre presentation. Uh, I, when I got the email about this uh, event, I was thinking, oh my God, should I go? Or, you know, is this all over again? But I'm really glad that I came. I, um, I'm happy that you all have made a great presentation. So now my question is this. Given what you have mentioned about the hidden powers and the uh, people who control the scenes 
behind the scenes like the CIA and you know all the the powerful people do you think if we manage to get another investigation going on 911 uh what makes us think that we will have the truth the second time around and also question. suppose magically uh you were to become president and you were to become uh, attorney general and you all had all the power and money do you think once you get into that position the powers that be the the you know the so called shadow powers will they stop you all from doing what you want to do and what all of us want to do we certainly believe that i believe that the official report is total bs we need the truth but is it possible well those are two very good questions um on the first one about a new investigation um obviously it can't be done by the government <laughs> you know they did that we know how that'll turn out uh, it has to be done some other way, and, and uh, we don't know exactly how and w what way that might happen. Uh, we just know that it has to happen, and we're pushing for it. Um, it could happen internationally in the sense of uh, getting something like the, the World Court or something like that involved. Uh, the, but the, the key issue uh, Richard mentioned, it's got to have teeth. It's got to be able to do something about it because there's been, uh, you know, independent things that happened that didn't have teeth that didn't really accomplish much, particularly in light, again, of the corporate media who won't report on things like this. So it has to be something new and different. Now, there are those of, there are people in this 9-11 truth movement who support the model of South Africa and truth and reconciliation models as possibly the only way to get any kind of investigation where uh, we're gonna get anywhere near the truth. Uh, it, on an official level in terms of that. And um, there's resistance to that. Uh, people that look at that model say, you know, there's no way I want the perpetrators of this to essentially get off uh, without being uh, severely punished. And the truth and reconciliation model does not support that. Um, for, from my own point of view, it's a question of practicality. Uh, it's not that I'm enthusiastic about the purpose, so, so to speak, getting off, but rather that uh, when you're dealing with this things this massive that involve uh, changes in people's world's view and, and uh, changing uh, systems on a fundamental level, um, when you have crimes of the magnitude of 9-11 or apartheid in South Africa, it may be well be, and it is my belief that the truth and reconciliation model is the only one that can possibly work. So regardless of the, of re the resistance and hesitation and reticence to go there, I, I strongly uh, support that model as, as I say, possibly the only thing that can work. And under that model, things do come forth because of, and, and, and you, if you don't know exactly what I'm talking about, take some time to study it because um, by offering people who are willing to tell the whole truth uh, not to be prosecuted, you open the door to all kinds of whistleblowers who will never otherwise ever come forth. And it did work in South Africa, and therefore I, I think it's something we have to seriously consider as an option to get a real investigation. Otherwise, your, your concerns are, are totally valid. It can't obviously happen through the government. If it's not happening through the government, it's not going to have any teeth. So, you know, what are our options? Uh, your other question was, I'm sorry, it was a good one. If you were president, oh, oh, could we do so? No. <laughs> and in other words, the system as it currently exists and has existed apparently for uh, we don't know how many decades is so severely broken that uh, there's two things stand in the way of you know us becoming any kind of high officials besides the fact that I wouldn't have any desire whatsoever to do that. Uh, and that is that, um, A, you cannot get in a position to get into power. In other words, for instance, you cannot be nominated for president in this country until you've passed certain tests, so to speak, um, which apparently Obama passed, and, and so does every other candidate. I mean, you, you know, you think about the two political parties as they exist. Uh, they differ on many social issues, which is important and valid, but when it comes to issues of war, of banks, of other issues involving how the world works and the power of the works, 
there is no difference between the two parties. Um, so, and, and we do have a two-party system, a three-party, alternative parties have been uh, totally disempowered. You know, you can't even have, get into a debates anymore. Ask Ralph Nader about that. Um, so, so we got a, the system is so broken that working in within the system at this time in that way is futile. It's just simply not going to happen. So what what is needs to happen and what is happening is going to the people directly. This is about changing people's consciousness, changing their worldview, changing the way they understand the world, how the world works, and that's. To my mind the only real solution and that's what we're doing and that's what we're going to continue to do and we're going to use 9-11 truth other people have other approaches but um, this the system is way too broken to work within it to solve the problem and so we have to find other alternatives can you stand up please So my question is, I have that awareness you're speaking of, but I personally feel frustrated and I feel impotent when it comes to making an effective change because the fox is not going to investigate himself as the marauder of the chicken coop. Uh, the, the government isn't going to do that, and effectively we can sit here and say, yeah, they did it. But what as does that soon do? as a critical mass of people awaken as you have, and that may be 10, 20, 30 percent, I don't really know, uh, there will be the, the, the effect of, of the hundredth monkey, you know. Uh, pretty soon it, it just travels. Truth has a way of permeating density and, and, and lies. And, and so our hope is that by educating uh, people uh, in a grassroots level uh, from the bottom up, uh, which is one of the reasons we're doing this Rethink 9-11 campaign, uh, we're spending $250,000, which in some cases could be seen as a drop in the bucket compared to corporate advertising, but in other cases uh, just getting it out there and making it a, a, a viral event that the mainstream media has to cover through guerrilla tactics like that, we can um, break through. After all, even Geraldo Rivera played uh, Building 7 coming down and had our engineers on his studio uh, back in, in, in 2009. It, it didn't have the big breakthrough effect, uh, but a few more of those can add up. And eventually, the government gets replaced with people who will investigate 9-11. I, I hear you, and personally, I think there's already, like in the Bay Area, are there 50,000 people who could blockade the entrance to the Golden Gate Bridge from each end? I, I, uh, that would get media coverage. Um, there's civil disobedience. There's already enough people to create civil disobedience and, and catapult these issues into the public eye. Why, why not organize at that level? Because there are enough people out there who, like myself, I'm like, I want to do something. I'm impassioned. I, 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 I have lots of feelings and, and commitment to this, but I have no context to express it. Well, I think we need to be able to fill an auditorium like this before we can anticipate being successful in major events like that. So uh, we're still early in the process, apparently. Well, thank you for your efforts. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, Over also, here. just let me add that um, I, I don't personally believe that the strategies and techniques we've used in the past uh, are particularly effective anymore. So I understand wanting to do blockades, and I, and I don't object. I mean, if, you, if people want to do that, bravo, but the, the powers that be, you know, that have effectively taken over the system have seen what we've done to, say, end the, the, the Vietnam War. We've seen what, what strategies in the past have worked, and they have made counter strategies to disempower them and probably the single biggest one we've already talked about, and that's the corporate media. Now, if you look at the, 
at the evolution of the corporate media and how it's covered various things like this over the last, let's say, four or five decades. This is a profound change. Uh, during the Vietnam War, there was rep uh, television coverage of the Vietnam War that was so disturbing to the American people that that's one of the major reasons that war, the demand for that war, the tipping point that uh, Richard referred to happened because uh, it, it was, people were seeing it on their televisions. I was aware in 19, was it 91, when I watched the television coverage of um, the, the first Gulf War, that we'd already passed a point of no return on that kind of thing. The, the coverage of the first Gulf War was a video game. It was, um, it was just it totally sanitized. And I knew right then that we were in really deep trouble. And that was how many decades ago. So the point is, as long as the corporate media has a stranglehold, it has doing big actions and hoping to get the coverage, no, we're not. I mean, it, look, look what happened in the run-up to the Iraq War. There were literally millions of people in the street all over the world. And corporate media barely, barely covered it. Uh, we live in a different world. It's a different game. We've got to play, come up with different solutions. And ground up grassroots is the best thing we have to work with. And so working one to one with the people we know, it's going to make a difference. And what's the time thing? Yeah, you're really waiting at the mic. Yeah, they're really waiting at the mic. Can you hear them, please? Go ahead. Hi. Hi, Richard. I have a couple questions. Can't hear you. Oh, closer to the maybe mic? it isn't working. Closer to the mic, closer. please. Okay. Richard, I have a couple questions for you. First, I wonder if you could uh, fill us in a little bit more about th this bizarre completeness of destruction in all three uh, World Trade Center buildings. I mean, were there um, were no file cabinets or toilets and things like that that were discovered afterward, the mechanism for that. And the other would be what you think uh, the tremendous. Let's take uh, one question oh, at a time. Okay. Um, what, what's fascinating, and it's true, uh, they found one file cabinet out of tens of thousands of steel file cabinets, and it was in the basement. And you could pick it up with your pinky. It was a little piece of a file cabinet with file folder edges uh, on, on it. Uh, why? Uh, why were there 700 bone fragments found across the street uh, on top of the Deutsche Bank building? Why uh, are there no um, uh, uh, toilets found? And, and the, the, uh, the air conditioner uh, condensers uh, uh, and, well, excuse me, the, the electrical transformers of which there were dozens of huge multi-ton units. They are not found either. Um, so the place was so well packed, apparently, with uh, some form of explosives that uh, these, these, uh, uh, these components and these floor systems uh, are, are completely pulverized. Uh, it's clearly not due to fire. Uh, we need a real investigation just to find out the exact mechanism. What we have evidence for is nanothermite, thermite, and uh, visual evidence of high explosives. Yeah, that was, it. That was part of my question. Um, the demolitions of building, uh, buildings one and two look quite different than building seven. So it's kind of part B of that question. Was there similar complete internal destruction? And then in uh, World Trade Centers 1 and 2, there's this enormous upward, outward explosive energy that you showed us. And what do you think ultimately the source of that is? I mean, was it uh, a well, high explosive a, form of thermite or something take, else? Yeah, let's take it one at a time. Building 7 was a classic controlled demolition and implosion. Normally, for those types of buildings, they use high energy explosives like C4 and RDX. But those have very bright flashes, extremely loud bangs. And in a deceptive controlled demolition, they would not want to have those signatures. So uh, apparently, they went to uh, incendiaries, which don't have those signatures, but 
leave pools of molten iron and melted steel. So we have the evidence for that. So that's pretty obvious. Um, so in the case of the towers, uh, there's, it's much more explosive after the first four seconds when, when the upper part g g really drops suddenly, symmetrically almost, uh, straight down in the case of the North Tower. And, and then what happens is the uh, hundreds of witnesses of explosions like firecrackers pop, pop, pop with this lateral distribution uh, of uh, which is obviously a, a high energy explosive series of those um, uh, propelling these. The one question is why would that be so, uh, so explosive? Why would they give it away? Well, um, if you didn't have access to the exterior perimeter skeleton, in this case, only the, the, the core, you might have had to have planted so much explosive that would take out not only the core, but the floor systems, as well as get rid of those exterior skeletons, which you might not have had an opportunity to place explosives in, because they're obviously near all of the occupied areas. Uh, so. There's a lot of speculation here. Um, the, the application of nanothermite is less well known. They probably, well, they may not have had access. Uh, well, we, we don't think the nanothermite was painted on steel beams. That wouldn't be effective. Um, it, it probably was painted on the bottoms of, of the steel decking on the floors. There were fireproofing retrofits, for instance, in the floors immediately above and below the point of jet plane impacts in each of the buildings, which is very well documented by Kevin Ryan in one of his essays on Journal of 911studies.com. Uh, it could be that people were unwittingly uh, hired to spray on this material uh, in, on those undersides of those floors uh, uh, relative to the jet plane impacts. So, uh, these, these, beyond this, there's, there are questions that remain, and we certainly need a, an investigation. We'd love to have somebody come forward and said, I participated in mass murder, and here's how it went down. Um, we don't have those people yet. Yes, okay, sir. I'm told that we're about out of time. Uh, a couple more people in line. Uh, we're going to have to limit it to one more question so that we can wind down today. So, last gentleman, I hope it's a short question, and <laughs> apologies to anyone remaining in line. We'll be out in the lobby, though, for whatever questions you have, and of course, at the restaurant called Walter Mitty's, right across the street. Um, I worked in the uh, railroad industry, and we used a uh, process called the thermite, thermite boutet process. It's a French uh, process, and uh, I was always amazed at how quickly you can uh, join pieces of rail and in a, in, a, in a matter of seconds you can create what's called ribbon rail and lay down miles of track with conti without uh, angle bars or joints in a continuous process. And um, after having you know dealt with that, I can see why uh, thermite would be so effective in uh, the uh, building demolition industry. And I guess where I'm leading you here is you know, um, it's, you buy that material and those devices that you showed on your, uh, on your video, can you actually buy those uh, devices to plant on buildings to, to uh, in, in effect, uh, do the opposite of what I, what I was involved with, which was joining metal together very quickly. Um, uh, there are certainly high energy explosive cutter charge devices that you can get. I don't know if thermite, pat they're patented certainly, and they were before 2001, uh, these thermite devices, again, ejecting uh, molten iron in milliseconds, cutting through much thicker uh, layers of steel than high energy explosives can even do. So it's more effective, much more expensive. Uh, so it's not common at all. In fact, it's never been used in the controlled demolition industry. Um, so, th did I answer your question? So they, they Microphone? So, so they would just, there's not a device that could just plant on the side of a piece of metal and then just go to the next piece of metal and plant another one? And 
Well, the device itself is self-consuming. Uh, so, uh, no, you wouldn't pick it up and plan it on the next one, pick it up and plan it on the next one. We're talking about thousands of cutter charges that are destroyed in this operation that are extremely expensive that, by the way, don't have miles and miles of wire that would have been seen by witnesses. Um, these are probably very high-tech, remotely detonated, computer-controlled devices. Uh, so, uh, very, very high-tech operation. Let's uh, thank our two speakers. And um, <laughs> and thank you all very much for, for the courage that it takes to come out and, and, and look at these things. Um.